Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. When combatants either cannot or would not use their ground maneuver forces in a military campaign, and artillery is not precise enough for hitting targets where collateral damage is forbidden, there is only one tool available in the General Staff's box, namely the Air Force. Offensively by fighter bombers, helicopters, and unmanned aerial vehicles, defensively by anti-missile systems, and through persistent and time-critical intelligence collection and mission overwatch, the Israel Air Force has proven itself as the go-to branch in the IDF. This is the popular view, and in order to find out whether it is also the professional one, let's turn to two senior veterans of the IAF, one who dedicated his uh, service to flying, and one who was determined to intercept whoever and whatever was flying with unfriendly intentions. Namely, Brigadier General and Reserve Doron Gavish, who is the former Chief of Air Defense of the Israeli Air Force. Thank you for joining us, General. Thank you, General. Also, uh, Colonel and Reserve Reuven Ben Shalom, who is a cross cultural strategist. Uh, uh, and I can go through an entire list, but let's focus also on uh, the relevance uh, and IAF pilot, uh, among others, and of course our TV7 editor at large, Amir Oren, host of Watchman Talk, Powers in Play, and so much more. Amir. Take it away. So there are three components um, in the Israeli force buildup. You have offense, defense, and on defense. And on defense, we see the ground troops waiting um, figuratively and sometimes really sitting across the obstacle, across the fence in uh, Lebanon or in Gaza, waiting uh, for the balloon to go up, for the uh, orders to come down, and lo and behold, they stay there. Of course, they have uh, their own uh, deterrent uh, uh, power, but their masters, both the political echelon and the general staff, prefer to use the Air Force. And the Air Force, uh, obviously, is being exploited both for hitting targets very precisely, we have seen the uh, bombs go into a certain room in a certain apartment on a certain floor rather than um, collapse the entire building. And we have seen Iron Dome, David Sling, and the entire system, which of course also uh, has to do with command and control, with alert, with passive defense, defending the Israeli population. So right now, it seems as if the mixture of intelligence assets, operational staff, which used to be the bottleneck, and Air Force assets, both air defense and flying vehicles, manned and unmanned, this is Israel's go-to answer. Well, uh, I'd like to ask General Gavish to provide your input into this, uh, considering also lessons learned uh, from the not too distant past, uh, among others, uh, the Second Lebanon War. We had a chief of general staff for the first time uh, who came from the Air Force, of course, uh, somebody who also had a quite, uh, 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 I would say, boastful doctrine. Uh, to a certain degree of being able to subdue enemies from the air rather than uh, utilizing ground maneuvers, something that uh, later was uh, refuted to a certain degree. Uh, nevertheless, uh, to what level does aerial superiority grant uh, the, the Israeli capacity to maintain its security? That's an that's important and good question because the air superiority, it's, um, of course, we need it in order to operate within, uh, within our region. Of course, it is very important uh, strategically. Military uh, strategy is, uh, is part of it. But although be, coming from the Air Force, um, I think that it's not only about the air. Uh, because at the end of the day, there are some things that you could do only on the ground. And the capabilities that uh, are needed uh, in the ground are still there. Uh, it could be tanks, it could be armor, armor tanks, uh, and it could be also a man. Uh, but I think that the idea of uh, boots on the ground, and we, we, we like this term here, it's still very, very important. Uh, so I think air superiority is very important. I, I think that we could do a lot of things from the air. 
Uh, it, it has to do a lot with, with our deterrence and, and a lot of other things. But I don't think that it comes instead uh, or completely um, denied the, the need for a for grant process. Uh, it's there. I think we, we still need it, and uh, hopefully we won't use it. Uh, but I think this is, this is something which is uh, still needed. Colonel Mancello? When you invited me to this show, I thought, oh, this is going to be easy, you know? Air Force, air supremacy. It's easier than all these grand strategy, China, Russia. But no, it's, it's, yeah. it's complicated. And why? Because I think the human factor here is very complicated. Because as Israelis, when we discuss this, there are emotional issues, things that even have to do with ego. Uh, I think the entire force structure today is derived from ego. Things could have taken... Ego in the Air ego, Force? Ego in general, and certainly in the Air Force. <laughs> And, and what do I mean by this? Uh, we're in we're an, an age of technological breakthroughs, and the war is going to become more and more technological. You press a button, and what you, what you want to achieve happens. By the way, in your opening remarks, you talked about artillery, uh, so it's, artillery is also technological. You press a button, it happens. And by the way, with accuracy that is becoming more and more similar to the Air Force. I would even ask, why do pilots have to take off in a machine to babysit a bomb and then press a button and come back to land, and the bomb flies 300 miles, hits its target on its own, so why even babysit the bomb up? Why not just press a button, the bomb will take off? Cruise missiles, etc. So another issue is the multidimensional component, what the previous Chief of General Staff spoke about a lot, but in, in truth was always there, what the Americans call jointness, joint, uh, joint army, and we, we actually never became joint enough. Why? Because we have this... This, this uh, ego clash, right? Ground forces, air force, who do you use? Another problem we have is we look at lessons learned from the previous campaign and we project that to the future. Sometimes even we, we fall in love with the previous campaign or if we made a mistake in the past, for instance, the ground maneuver in Israel, now we have this conception that the next operation will have to be a ground maneuver. Why? Because we didn't do it last time on time. Maybe not. That's why bottom line for this phase of the discussion, I will say we need to be multidimensional, joint force, have a set of tools and use the right tools to achieve the objectives. That means the most important thing is to define the objectives, and that the government does. So we have to maybe start to be more cold and calculated the way we view warfare. When we're looking at Israel's past, uh, particularly in confrontations between Israel and Egypt in the past, Russia played a factor in taking out Israel's aerial superiority to a certain period of time, uh, which brought about also certain lessons learned from that uh, situation, both for Israel as well as for the Russians, who uh, confronted the Israeli Air Force ultimately and uh, was uh, beaten time and again uh, on a few waves that it uh, attempted to penetrate Israeli airspace. Tell us a little bit about that and to what degree are those lessons currently implemented vis-a-vis -vis our northern sector. So it all started with Adam and Eve and the serpent. <laughs> but uh, uh, a few if, years later, a few yeah. <laughs> um, let's let's uh, fast forward to uh, the uh, establishment of Israel 75 years ago. Obviously, ground forces uh, were of paramount need because Israel wanted to withstand an invasion, an invasion by ground forces. The air forces of the time were very primitive, both Israel's and the other countries, even though the very first morning of Israel's existence, the Egyptian air force struck the Tel Aviv airport, Sdedov, uh, and Ben Gurion, who lived some two miles from there, um, said uh, to his colleagues later and wrote uh, in his journal, that uh, he awoke to the uh, uh, noise of, of the bombing. Now, um, by, by the way, the first interception of the Israeli Air Force was done there by the air defense. By the air defense. Just mentioning. Of, of course, of course. Uh, <laughs> it's Without you, we, where would we have been? Now, um, obviously, ground forces after Israel managed uh, to withstand the invasion and even broaden uh, its borders. The, uh, the mission had to do with ground forces because there were two possible goals or war aims. One was to get to the other side's capital. You can only do it by an armored column or power troopers, which you later link up to. And the other was to destroy 
the, the uh, opposing army. Again, you couldn't do it from the air. They took cover. You had to send your own divisions and brigades. Again, fast forward uh, once more. We have peace with Egypt and Jordan, two of the four neighbors we have. The remaining ones are Lebanon and Syria. In the meantime, Gaza has become a new battleground because Hamas is there. And you must tailor the force you are using to the mission. And also, uh, there was some injustice done to that former chief of defense staff, who was the chief of the Air Force, Dan Khalutz. Of course, he knew that he must also, uh, in certain uh, cases, use the ground troops. It's a matter of cost effectiveness and of priorities. If you're going to send troops and pay with heavy casualties, and Israeli society has become casualty averse, yeah. uh, then you must weigh very carefully whether whatever you're going to achieve is worth the cost. Indeed, of course, Don Harutz also uh, was uh, hosted by you here on the show in the studio. Yeah. And uh, we had uh, uh, the pleasure of uh, hearing him speak about those uh, particulars that you just mentioned. But I'd like to ask you, General Kavish, uh, I'd like to go to the 50s and, and the deployment of Russian systems in Egypt that ultimately uh, challenged Israel's aerial superiority and then brought about uh, various confrontations that ultimately uh, also uh, granted Israel the upper hand by ground maneuver that once again reaffirmed Israel's aerial superiority and granted it uh, the, the upper hand over the Egyptians and the Russians for that matter. Uh, to what degree is this now being also factored in on our doctrine when we're looking northward? I think it, it is still very important. Of course, you know, there is, there is always this fight between the, the airplane and the, and the surface uh, missile, and, and the, it's kind of a circle. There is one technology and then the other technologies and, and so on. So it is still uh, being factored uh, here in, in our area. We have to remember that uh, one of our airplanes were intercepted a few years ago by those uh, capabilities. So they are there, they are serious, and we have to look at them very uh, seriously. Uh, so, um, so I think that in general, for for us, for Israel, this is all. This is always still is, and probably would be in the in the future uh, something which is uh, very important to look at. Uh, we we uh, we're putting a lot of uh, efforts, uh, intelligence efforts, in order to see what is exactly happening there in this uh, in, in this aspect of uh, uh, missiles uh, that could intercept our airplanes. So yes, this is going to play a factor. It is playing factor now, and it probably would play a factor uh, also in the future. Not only missiles, of course, there's also electronic warfare that is challenging unmanned exactly. aerial vehicles, yeah. capability of right. even intelligence collection yeah. in Syria. As it was mentioned by Reuven, the, the, the technology is kicking in, but not only in our part, also in our, our opponents' part, or our enemies' Is, uh, part so we this is right this is uh, this is all kind of uh, capabilities that we are seeing uh, which would uh, in challenge our uh, air superiority we are still there and uh, sometimes you know even when they are using technology it, it even comes to our benefit uh, but but in general this is really something that uh, we would it, it would stay I would stay for a while I would like also just to mention you before you you were, you were talking about 2006. There is a huge difference, if we're talking about the Air Force, between 2006 and uh, where we are now in the defense. In 2006, there were 4,000 rockets shot toward Israel. We, we even didn't intercept one because we had no the capabilities. Today, we are completely in a, in a different area. Today, uh, the last escalation that we were in, uh, we, it was 96% of uh, interception rate. So this is another dimension that was added uh, in the last uh, 15 uh, years, which is uh, also uh, important, and allow us, again, much more, I would say, flexibility uh, to fight in the, in the attack uh, part of it. Of course, uh, Amir Peretz, uh, who was uh, uh, in 2007, if I'm not mistaken, the six. defense minister. Yeah, and until, until, until June, of, June of 2007, with his director uh, general, was Gabi Ashkenazi, who subsequently yeah. also became chief of general staff. They took the decision yeah. to uh, start uh, the 
crazy assumption that an Iron Dome was even viable. And uh, of course, you've subsequently also integrated in, into the Israeli Air Force, which was then uh, a key component of Israeli air defense and then uh, saved countless lives. Uh, I don't know how we can truly co- quantify yeah. this. Uh, and matter. lessened pressure on decision makers to go on the offensive. This is no less important. The fact that there are no casualties, of course, in human terms, uh, this is paramount. But the other um, support that this gives the country is that there is no domestic pressure to do anything hasty. And it, you know, it grants uh, more leeway to the government to take uh, tough uh, decisions, which become less tough when you don't have pressure. Um, Colonel, uh, to what degree does the defensive enforce uh, the the offensive basically in the past uh, there used to be said uh, the best defense is a good offense is that still the case or is it now a good defense uh, which allows uh, some uh, respite uh, for the general public uh, to again uh, grant uh, le- uh, the mm-hmm. the room for the leadership to take uh, the decisions and and uh, have more Uh, breath within uh, the the offensive capabilities. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think it's all one, and you know we have the main pillars of our defense doctrine. Um, probably one of the most important is uh, is deterrence, even making you know pushing away all conflict, making the other side think that it's not even worth it to to hit us. Uh, so I think I I think we can see it as one. And if it does happen, we want early warning. And if it If we have early warning and we're fast enough and we're strong enough, then we can have a decisive victory. So all these things tie in together. But what is the most important component of our defense doctrine? Resilience, I think. Uh, so this ties into what we discussed now of our, uh, our more sensitivity now to, to fallen soldiers, maybe too much, by the way, for a military, and, uh, and the resilience of the people themselves. Uh, and we, by the way, we can be the way we are now because of these systems. I view the whole way we, 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 we promote ourselves during the years as cultural. Um, and, and why do I say this? Because even the people developing these systems, they, they come to this with a cultural approach, an organizational culture approach, breaking down the barriers, understanding the need, doing things faster probably than anywhere else in the world, I think, as far as, as understanding the need, building it, fielding it. Another issue is international cooperation, something General Gavish has been doing for many, many years. That means you have the technology, that's nice, but getting together with mainly our American partners and building the strategy and doing the exercise and the lessons learned, I think there's an amazing, amazing development there. It's, it's miraculous. I, I usually don't talk this way, right? But it's only technology. No, it's, it's miraculous because of what the people put into it. So altogether, we have this ability now. When we use the word supremacy, I think that is one of the key factors of our defense strategy in general, supremacy. That means we are cutting edge. We're the best at what we do from cyber warfare to air superiority. And I think probably because we have no choice. That means our culture evolved like this because we have no choice, because of where we are in our history and everything. We have no choice but to be the best, and our enemies have to know we're the best, which factors into all the calculations. Sorry for all this lecture, but... Let me make two points, please. Um, the first one is that uh, the Air Force uh, doctrine, which uh, obviously impacted the entire defense doctrine, used to be only offensive. And one of the uh, uh, reasons, um, the cultural reason, of course, was that the Air Force leadership uh, was composed of fighter pilots, jocks, aces. But the other part was that um, this was the economical way to go. Rather than invest 100 million shekels in concrete shelters, you don't even know whether the enemy will attack you when, rather than do that, let's put it into an F-4 Phantom, and it can be very versatile, go from this front to the other. Yes, but when we look at Uh, the Israeli landscape, and I think geography is very important here to factor in. There is no strategic depth of field. No, no, but that, and that, that, when we look at the strategic depth of field, as you said, even the Barlev lines that were tried to be implemented in uh, the, the Sinai Peninsula, only how much was it? Eight to 10% percent was uh, ultimately accommodated, fiscally speaking, into those no, defenses. But, but, Uh, this had to do with a war of attrition. This is something else. But, but the um, Air Force doctrine um, was uh, geared to the uh, 
general defense doctrine, but it had um, a fatal flaw. It left the initiative to the other side. So if, for instance, Saddam Hussein wanted Israel to retaliate for strategic reasons, because he wanted to break up the coalition during Desert Storm, he wanted to hit Israel in order for the Israeli Air Force to retaliate. That meant that he, Saddam, was within our decision cycle. He could have manipulated us and uh, cooler heads prevailed because of American pressure and other considerations, and we did not attack targets in Western Iraq. Now, uh, the other point is that very few Israelis, myself accepted, have had the experience of being under enemy aerial attack. It is a frightening experience if you are somewhere across the border and a Syrian Sukhoi appears and bombs you for the two minutes before the Israeli Phantom or F-15 arrives and shoots it down, this is a terrifying experience. And Doron's uh, people, colleagues, officers, and men have spared most Israelis from this experience. So it is taken for granted that the ground troops will always have air superiority above them. But this was not always so. And therefore, the shift in the air defense was from accompanying, escorting ground troops, because you also had mobile uh, air defense in order to let the armor infantry team penetrate Egyptian or Jordanian or Syrian defenses. Um, you have been so successful that people forgot about this mission too. Yeah, but if I, if I may add on what was said uh, rightly by, by Amir, is that uh, we have to remember that uh, the Air Force had to adapt his uh, strategies uh, to the threat. And what really was changed is that in the last uh, 20 years, we saw it in 2006 again, the, our enemy changed his uh, strategy. They understood that it would be very hard to fight against us, uh, with, against airplane to airplane. They all, they still remember 18, uh, 1982, which I think the score was 100-0, something like this, uh, interceptions of uh, Syrian airplanes and zero Israelis. So they, they wanted to find a different way to attack Israel. And then the missiles became something minor on their uh, strategy. And we had to develop our strategies, our doctrine, and uh, some of uh, our defense uh, um, uh, systems uh, to, this, uh, to this threat. So I think that in the past, maybe if you would ask an uh, Israeli uh, Air Force uh, veteran, he would speak about uh, attack, attack, attack. But things have changed today. Today, everyone understands that also within the Air Force and, and within the, uh, the IDF that it is, it's all about uh, offense, defense, alert, intelligence, and deterrence. I mean, this is really the, the, the full uh, package. And, yeah. and I must go, and I must just mention one thing. You, you said before about uh, the best uh, defense is offense. So being, an, and you are a good basketball player, uh, and I'm a good, and I'm a fan of uh, basketball, I, I always say that the best offense is, the, the, sorry, the, 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 the win start in the defense. So I think this is also... Depends something. on which league. Well, in, <laughs> in the NBA. Right. Well, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we have roughly three minutes left, and, and I do want uh, to expand on this uh, point because uh, the, the chief enemy of, of the state of Israel currently, the Islamic Republic of Iran, does hold one of the largest arsenals of, of uh, missiles, cruise missiles, and unmanned aerial vehicles, one-way unmanned aerial vehicles uh, in the world and the largest in the Middle East, something that Israel obviously needs to contend with, and, and you included. What is currently the, the biggest um, point that needs to be focused on? No, I, I think, uh, you know, you're mentioning Iran, and of course Iran is, uh, is our um, strategic uh, threat, and, and, and we, we must uh, uh, look at it uh, as a such. Um, Israel is uh, really looking at it and uh, the, the basically building, building his uh, strategies. And then if we are talking about um, the defense uh, strategy, we have to remember that 
Israel have this uh, concept of uh, multi-tier uh, defense. This is designed exactly for uh, those things, the Aero 2, the Aero 3, the David Sling, and, and also the Iron Dome. So this idea of uh, multi-tier defense was uh, built exactly for, for this threat. So this is something, the first thing that we are looking at. The, the second thing is really the strategy, and, and we mentioned it uh, before, and I think Ruven was uh, fully right, that uh, we need uh, the, the basket of tools. So, uh, and mainly with Iran, we have to make sure that we have the full basket for offense, defense, special forces, cyber capabilities, uh, all of uh, those things. So yes, Iran, it's a major threat, and uh, for sure uh, we are looking at it, and, and the idea is really to build a basket of, of uh, tools and capabilities. Colonel Manchelo. Our strategy it should be and is, I think, full spectrum dominance from cyber warfare and intelligence, and our prime minister says it very clearly, we know everything, right? Uh, and our ability to defend this multi-tier concept. And again, uh, Doron has been working on it for years. That goes to all fields, full spectrum, the ability to defend and attack. But even though we talk about air supremacy and all these uh, technologies, bottom line, Golani Brigade, our soldiers are still needed. Super important. Super important. They're going to be, by the way, our heroes in 15 years. There will be no pilots in 15 years, no need. We still will have Golani and Givati infantry warriors because we need all that capability. We need also to be able to put 200 of these soldiers, fly them to 1,000 kilometers, and do whatever needs to be done and come back. So that's, I think, our philosophy. Yeah. Until so, all pilots become panelists, because uh, they will retire and have their experience to share, Israel must conserve its force. The, the time when uh, wars and campaigns came only every eight or 10 years is over. So if it's every year, or every couple of years, Israel must use its force, air and ground, very judiciously. Indeed. Well, this is all the time that we have for today, so I'd like to thank General Gavish, okay. Colonel Ben Shalom, and Mr. Owen for being part of today's panel. I'd like to thank all of you at home as well. Until next time, Shalom.